welcome everyone very warmly to maybe the fourth uh, analyzing an online colloquium of the lifetime. And we have a very special uh, event today. We can celebrate Erno's lifelong career and birthday with uh, Douglas and Julie uh, in Denver. But now to the, our speakers, our dear speakers, who are going to uh, tell us about pathways to early math and how you can build your curricu curriculum really heavily based on the research evidence on numerical cognition and how it develops uh, uh, from early age. And this is the, the couple in early math education and it's a, really a huge, fantastic honor to have them being here with us now. Um, for Julie and Doug, um, just to let you know, we have this uh, tradition already to introduce our speakers in numbers and in words. And here I would like to say that I was kind of counting in a, in a funny way. So I thought like, in your case, I think it's true that one plus one equals more than two. So I was happy to count all your publications, just summing them to, together and found like an amazing number. And even more so like me and Erno and our kind of participants, most of them, us have several times certainly cited your fantastic and groundbreaking research on early math. Um, and when I uh, count your age index uh, together, it's uh, almost 60. So it's nearly as much as uh, our birthday boy here <laughs> in, in years. Uh, in words, then, I found this kind of a nice video from uh, internet and took a snapshot because I thought like this tells something about you very nicely, you too. Uh, I think your research and your work has been really empowering early educators worldwide and that's very important uh, thing and amazing accomplishment. You have been unbelievably effective and if, if anyone of, um, sees you in some conferences or some other places, you can't help how effectively you present and, and uh, approach the space and how, how wonderfully it goes. So I thought those are two E words. Um, it, uh, with L, I think love is the thing. If you look at that picture, there's love, but also if, if <laughs> clearly, if you look at, um, if anyone looks at your videos with the children, that's love, what you see there, like how you admire and how respectfully you act with the kids, that's so beautiful. That's how we want to work all with the children. Uh, lively. Uh, so that's also your presence, like how you are, you are, you are, uh, acting uh, lively, I think, so two L words as well. I think your work is a reflection of optimism, definitely. And your um, accomplishments are outstanding in the field. And I, I don't know if anyone can be there if any, ever, or even me too. Like it's just uh, really exceptional what you have done. And it's also the way how you have been presenting your work in the conferences where I have been or in the papers that I have read. Um, I think they are truly compelling. Like I hear sometimes people saying or researchers saying like, no, it's not possible to do it so well. But then I hear you presenting it. I, I read your papers and I'm convinced. And as I said, your presentations typically are very captivating. So this is the moment <laughs> to let you start with your today's presentation and let it be as informal as you feel comfortable about. So welcome dearly, Douglas and Julie, to our online event. We are very happy to have you. 
Thank you so much. That introduction was uh, amazing. I kind of feel like we should stop now while we're at <laughs> while we're at Yeah, we just, we'll just, we'll just we'll leave. We'll just disappoint we'll people. Do, I, know, I know. There's no way to live up to that. That was, that was amazing. I want to just, you know, I, uh, if, if this is being recorded, I want to take that beginning and give it to my kids who, <laughs> who, maybe, who aren't really convinced that we're any of those things. So that'll be good. Um, but thank you. It's nice. It's nice to be here. We're really excited to present, and uh, we're going to talk about um, about children's uh, math learning, our work in learning trajectories, uh, starting in con cognition, and then moving up to work with teachers. So go ahead, Doug. So, you know, one of the main things that we do believe that that Mina just said is. Young children have an amazingly broad, complex, and sophisticated understanding of mathematics. Just to get a, a concrete illustration of that, right? These kids had been through our building blocks program. They're preschoolers. They're four. Uh, it's more towards the end of the year. And they grabbed this puzzle. It's not part of our materials. It's just a puzzle off the shelf. But Corey puts four triangles together to make squares. So let me picture that at the top in case it's harder to see in the, in the actual picture so he makes a new shape a unit of units his friends want to help but one one of the boys sees the square structure but builds the wrong square he he puts two triangles together it doesn't fit they have a long discussion about it and when they're finished Corey shows the teacher who's uh, asks him how many triangles did you use and Corey very carefully one two three four five six all the way up to 24 Good counting for a four-year-old, but she doesn't stop. 24 what, she says? Triangles. And then because she's been watching how Corey and his friends think about it, she also asks, how many squares do you have? And Julian, I think this is really interesting because what they do is curl up a little finger, leaving four fingers down, and count one, two, three, four, five, six. So in two domains, the most important domains in early mathematics, number and geometry, Corey has made a unit of units. He can count them separately. He can count them as, as a unit and get six. He can see the triangles as separate shapes and synthesize those into a unit of units as well. He composed both with shape and number and actually two of the things we're gonna be talking about today. Very good, You're right, right. Why learning trajectories? We believe that there's a lot of research on mathematics that has helped us build standards, research on developmental progressions or levels of thinking that have helped us build assessments, and research on instruction that helps us build curriculum and teaching. But learning trajectories, a scientific approach to learning trajectories, weaves those three corpi together so that standards, curriculum, teaching, and assessments all come from a common research base. And what does this look like? What our learning trajectories look like? Well, we have books, but we also have this nice resource online. Um, and, 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 and the idea is that we're not talking about just number. We're looking at, go ahead, um, way more than that. We're really talking about the breadth of mathematics. So we have individual learning trajectories on all these different topics. Clearly, we can't talk about all of these today, but we're going to talk about subitizing, and we're going to talk a little bit about counting, composing 2D shapes, and we're gonna talk about our latest research in arithmetic. So there are three parts to a learning trajectory. One is the goal, and we can, we can decide on a goal as a, as, as a community of, of scholars or as teacher practitioners or whatever. And the second thing is a developmental progression. And the way I often talk about a developmental progression with uh, parents and teachers is, is is it's not something that's scary. It's simply understanding that kids are going to develop um, sometimes in their own in their own way, but kind of generally follow guidelines. In other words, we know kids don't all develop lockstep as babies, but we do know that if we, our goal is to eventually get them to run across the run across the the field, that they're going to start by being able to sit up, then they're able to crawl, then they're able to 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 to, to stand up. And then, and then with help, and then walk, etc. So it really is just understanding that, and then knowing what am I going to do to help them achieve that next level. And that's the third part of learning trajectory: it's the instructional activities. And 
and, and, and the proficiencies, what I said were the goals, what we're going to decide on as a community should include, and for us they do include, conceptual understanding, procedural fluency, strategic competence, adaptive reasoning, and productive disposition. So it isn't only just a topic goal, but it is also uh, uh, thinking processes and, and affect, really, our, 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 our feelings towards mathematics and about mathematics. So we can start off with subitizing. Go ahead. So subitizing is just the ability to quickly recognize and, 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 and subitize is just the recognition quickly comes from the Latin word that means suddenly the number in a group, you know. And uh, of course, Min is famous for uh, um, extending that into the spontaneous um, uh, recognition of numbers and, and the like and focus on numbers. And, so, and we use her like research, that, just, and we just, use so you, just research so you know, it, it's going to come in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So seeing that group and knowing how many without the time to count is, is, is the basic goal at higher and higher numbers. Because this kind of developmental progression, this model of kids thinking and learning and development is what we start with when we're developing learning trajectories. So we want to look over these kind of building levels that have increasing sophistication, complexity, abstraction, and generality. And we start with research reviews like right. Minna's research and everybody we can, we can grab, including our and, own. Yeah, and across a variety of fields. So we look at developmental psychologists, cognitive psychologists, math educators, Etc. We really want to include all the research we can. And then what we do is we get, we get kind of an idea. We go in and we test these mental models with clinical interviews, really looking at children's ideas and strategies, both their intuitive ideas and informal strategies as well. And then we test, we get, you know, we further refine the model and we test and extend with teaching experiments, really trying to fill in that third part with the instructional activities. And we limit the task in the uh, adult interaction to individual children. We're trying to build the models of children's thinking and learning and really look at what are those key points that move kids into that next developmental level to, to again, refine those activities. And so we want the progression to include what students are able to do, what they're not yet able to do, but should be able to learn, and why. That is how they think and how they learned it. And this sets the, uh, the developmental progressions apart from efforts to develop sequences, because often when we talk to colleagues and we think we're talking about the same thing, what we get mm -hmm. is this idea that, that uh, for example, if children aren't going to understand fractions, oh, well, then they're going to have to know how to do a common denominator. And in order to do that, they're going to need at least common multiple. And they build up the progression based on the content or alone or alone and discrete skills alone with the adults understanding of what's needed to solve those problems and with uh, learning trajectories this is really centered on our understanding of the children and their mental models and that's what we're trying to do this I think different so let's uh, return to supervising and and the typical path children follow moving from one level to the next in broad strokes they start with the approximate number system We'll, we'll get back to all these. Mm -hmm. They move to what we call perceptual supertizing and then to conceptual supertizing. So the approximate number system, uh, this is from uh, Melissa Libertus and, and uh, Elizabeth Brannan's uh, laboratory. Um, just one example, couple month old baby, they show a picture to focus the baby's attention and then they show two different sides. Both sides change in arrangement and um, uh, the size of the dots and the like, but as you can see, only the one on the left is changing in number. And the idea is, does the child prefer one side over the other? And as you can see, the child's pretty much preferring watching that left side. Something's interesting there that, that goes beyond the area the, the, of, of the things. Oh, and did you see the quick check? Quick check on the other side to check, no, not interesting. In fact, very interesting. That was great. <laughs> this side is really cool. And he still looks at the other side just for a second to check out if something's changing over there and quickly rejects it as uninteresting compared to the side where number changes. So there's a check. And is that nice? No, it's not as good as this one. So that's the idea of these kind of different uh, ways to look at the approximate number system. And this is just a cute baby. 
<laughs> no, it's not just a cute baby. It's another kind of experiment called the habituation paradigm in which the, the, the child is shown like 30 or 40 of these pictures where the shapes change, the color change, the arrangement changes and everything. But now we're just looking at small numbers to see if they can differentiate by one. And with very small numbers like this, you wait until the child shows the infant version of bored. That is, looks around the room, the heart rate goes down, the pulse rate, you know, the, it goes down. Then you see this and whoop, the brain lights up again. The, the EEGs um, 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 show more activation, the heart rate goes up, the breathing becomes more rapid and the like. So what we do is we really look at even into pretty intensely cognitive research. Right, right. This is yours. What? Yeah, we're, we, 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 we're, we're really, yeah, we're looking at the basic cognitive neurodevelopmental science at the very beginning. And that's not, you know, exclusive of all the other fields we talked about. But we do include that because we're trying to understand development at and, its core level. And these are just a quick illustration of different models that people have come up with. What are babies processing when they're processing right. these different amounts so we you know that's the that's the sciencey part now let's talk about what we talk about again with teachers you think about our goal is sort of getting through that garden path making it through the fence and the developmental progression are the stepping stones along the way and then keep going uh, what we want to do is have activities that move children from one stone to the next so in subitizing, our lowest level is just our foundational levels. We're really making children sensitive to number and quantity. And then small collection neighbor, namer, where kids can see too, really, but there's not any, uh, anything that's um, quick about it. Uh, it. I always use the example of, of um, you know, coming from a parental perspective, uh, it, ch children coming up to you with one in each hand and saying, I have two, um, or I want two. If you give them one, one, one cookie, no, I want two. So then go on. Uh, then you're able to make small collections where they're able to sort of, if I have a collection of three, they can make three, but they, they don't know it's three. They can just make that. Okay. Can you show me a different way with your fingers? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Gives them a look like, do you get three yeah. now, finally? Um, uh, this little guy had, This little guy is the son of one of the people that used to work in our lab, and so this is just him walking into the lab and getting a, us getting a quick video. But yes, uh, he, he definitely wasn't able to, to name his small collection. Exactly. Now we're moving into perceptual subitizing. Oh, did you see it? Just a second, and we're hoping you saw four. And, and being able to perceptually supertize four is our next level, and then to five. And then we move into Doug's territory. Go ahead. No, conceptual supertizer to five is when they can see the parts and the whole at the same time. Right. So they don't say to themselves three and two is five. Right. They see three and two but they recognize that it's three and two and five simultaneously. Right. It actually means that subitizing, which is an alternative quantification method to counting, is more powerful than counting and setting the foundations for arithmetic right. because you see the parts in the whole at the same time. And that can go on if, we're, if we give kids uh, um, good representation. Okay. So let's watch some examples of this. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I'd like you to tell me how many grapes there are on this card. How many grapes? Ready? Just start the moment. How many grapes? Um, ten. Good girl. I wasn't even counting because I knew it was um, two, two five makes ten. That's right. Well, you've learned a lot, haven't you? Now I'm going to show you a card with some pennies on it. Try to tell me how many pennies are on this card when I show them to you, just for a quick moment. Ready? Fifteen. Oh, you're so smart. I like this 
smartest kid in my class. <laughs> She's like the smartest kid in my class. class. Yeah. Usually we have time to discuss this, but we this isn't this kind. Of, not, unfortunately, in this kind of uh, environment, it's a little more difficult. But this is an interesting case where she was able to uh, conceptually supertize ten, and she isn't able to conceptually supertize higher. At that point, she's adding. She's adding on in order to yeah, get the 15. I don't think they saw the, did, did it show the, the 15? It, it was did. three groups of yeah, five yeah, anyway, they, they, if you yeah, didn't see they that, did. it they went did. pretty quick. And so she sees the 10 and that has to figure out the, figure out the 15. Um, so had she been able to do the 15 and many, many more combinations, that's a goal for, right. you know, and a kindergarten or first grade or something like that is conceptual supervisor to 20. Here's another little girl that uh, that we like. We won't watch whole video, but we can see parts of it. Three, then you win. Six, five. How do you know it's five? Because these are four, and this is five, but not in the middle. Okay. How many dots? Those other ones are six. Has one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Seven. Sounds good. Sounds good. So as you can see, and and she's supervising some and and counting some and adding some. She's doing a bunch of things. Um, but the the idea is uh, uh, again for teachers is how you get good at supervising is by supervising. And so that's just a really nice example of um, kind of the uh, uh, activities that we would do with children. So going to the instructional activities, what we do is, is, is we want to be sure that they're connected to each level of the developmental progression. So that child, as Doug had said, was a conceptual supervisor to five to 10. We really want to target those levels. Um, and they're designed to promote the thinking at that level. The actions on objects often are reified in the activity. So we're going to unitize, compose number, etc. And when you say at that level, you mean the level beyond what the kids already right, right, right. To. We want to promote the the level of thinking where we're, they're working on, uh, and we want to include in those instructional activity the settings. Um, we want to say how would you structure the environment, um, particularly learning centers. Uh, what kind of interactions are you going to have with children? What kind of tasks are you going to do? And what teaching strategies are you going to use to take advantage of children who are, are, are really learning at exactly this level? Go ahead. Oh, finally, this is huge. This is active learning. These are not worksheets. We're really talking about uh, playing with children and children playing with mathematics. Uh, and we know we know that a simple but continuous intervention makes a huge difference. Ben is research, and, and actually that by other, your dissertation, um, and, and other people have followed up on that. We know it makes a huge difference if you just use numbers in everyday talk with kids at home and in classrooms, because it not only gives them hundreds of experiences with you thinking about number. So you saying, instead of saying, can you pick up the blocks? Can you pick up those three blocks that are still on the floor? But it also gives them thousands of spontaneous experiences that is engendered by their lens to see the world through mathematical eyes. Right. So we play a game called um, Snapshots then, which is very similar to what the child was doing with the, with the paper plates and the, and the dots. But in this case, you can put some objects under a plate, cover it, oh, show it for just a second, and then have the child, the children say how many are how many there. And it's a nice small group activity and the teacher can keep an eye on, 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 on where the children are in, their, in terms of their competencies. And then we have a tech game. We, we Watch have. your dashboard carefully and try again. So, you know, 
computer games kind of thing, get closer to the planet there is featured on that website well, Julie and showed earlier. That we that's wasn't that was in there just ever so briefly that we didn't talk about is the fact that when we get to higher numbers, we tend to use the representation of a tons frame yep. because we're trying to again build that mental image that they can build on for uh, arithmetic. Uh, again, teachers sometimes will think, oh, we're gonna trick them and try to use these really crazy arrangements. We want children to be anchored in this idea of 10, at least in our counting system. Yeah, the, the, the Australians who talk about their patterns and structure right. uh, 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 work, for, for sure, that's the structure part of that, as well as a visual pattern. And then we know some things not to do. Kathy Richardson, a uh, wonderful educator in California in the United States, uh, said she, in a chapter she wrote for Julie in my book, um, said she taught kids to see this arrangement and recognize it as five. And then she read more about constructive and she said, you know, I should have them do something more. So I'm going to have them build the five after afterwards. And she was a little distressed that many kids produce this or this or this. So because she had only used one representation, one arrangement, Kids, some kids saw a square or an X or something instead of a number. So what not to do is don't use the same arrangement all right. the time. Another thing that Bob Wright in Australia found is don't ignore it. And that seems silly, except that Bob found that kids actually regressed in subitizing from the beginning and the end of kindergarten. And when he went in the next year to say, well, how, why? Um, he found that kids would like throw a die in a, in a game, a racing game, and say five. And if the teacher were close, she'd say, you, you don't know that, count them. Count to make sure, count and check. So kids learned subitizing is no good in here. We have to count one by one every single time. So don't ignore it. Right. They're two wonderfully different and complementary quantification methods. Right. I think we already talked about this, about moving to yeah. conceptual. Yeah. Subitizing is important, and we're running out of time. And here we go. Here's some games with those tens frame uh, representation that we're talking about. And we know that, uh, you know, again, teachers will say, what are we subitizing? Why aren't we teaching counting? Counting's, counting isn't that our job. Our job is to teach counting. But they really offer each other co-mutual co support. Yeah, like one of our activities that we, we commonly talk about is how many in my hand. Here's a way most teachers typically teach this, right? I hope you can see my cursor. They'll just say to kids, put out some blocks and say to kids, count with me. And they'll go one, two, three, four, and the activity's over. Uh, they might do a different amount. What do we do differently? We say to kids, hey, you know, I was looking at those blocks today and I thought, how many can I fit in my hand? So behind my back, I have as many blocks as I can fit in my hand. And then the teacher says, count with me so you can see how many. And then the teacher will pull them out one at a time and say, one, two, three, I mean, the kids are counting with the teacher, four, and then gesture around them and say four. The important thing here for subitizing is she has already taught them to subitize one, two, three, and four. So for those kids that don't understand cardinality, the kids who will count one, two, three, four, and if you ask them how many, they'll say one, two, three, four, and if you ask them again, one, two, three, four. If you take they it away, they'll say 15 or something. Yeah, yeah. And they don't understand the last counting number tells how many in the group. Subitizing provides the quantification so they recognize, especially with the, the uh, uh, iterative addition of a thing. So in the first way, when you said one, you still saw four. Right. When you said uh, said two, you still saw four. This way, the subitizing is, co is connected to the counting. Those kind of careful manipulations leads to? Um, leads to success. So, so we take this, we work with teachers. Uh, we work with them for a very long period of time. We meet with them a couple days in the summer and then keep following up once a month. And uh, go ahead, Doug, what happens is, uh, is indeed success. So the teachers that we worked with, uh, that we taught them the learning trajectories and gave them the activities uh, did much better.
Go ahead. You know, some of them that didn't like that you spent so much time on math and not enough time on language well, and literacy. Right. One of the things in the approach is you're is so immersed in the experience of understanding children and understanding their development of mathematics that you start to worry, I'm seeing math everywhere. And again, uh, um, um, bringing up the, uh, 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 the uh, spontaneous mentioning of number made them start thinking about that all the time. And they were saying, well, I, what I'm worried. I'm worried I'm not teaching them their letters. I'm worried I'm teaching in their, their letter sounds and we need to focus on that. So we went back after about three months and we tested kids in language and literacy. We wanted to be sure that we hadn't hurt the children by doing more math. And in fact, um, there was no significant difference on, um, on letter, letter naming and, and, and some other measures. But we also found, well, we gave this test of oral language expression where we told them a story of a naughty bus. And then we asked the children, hey, tell us a story back. And the children um, in the in the triad group, in the group that with whom we worked, uh, scored significantly higher on giving more information when they retold the story, using complex sentence structures, being independent, meaning they needed less prompts to say, and then what happened, then what happened, and being able to answer inferential questions. So uh, we didn't we didn't hurt anybody in literacy in simply fact, by upping their math game. Yeah, we helped them. And we think. Why? Why? Talk oh, because, about why. Because, because one of the big things that we're doing is... That we didn't talk about yet. Right. We're encouraging teachers to have conversations around mathematics with young children. We're not just simply saying, how many are there? Count them. One, two, three, four, and you're done. We're saying all the time, how did you know? What did you see? What were you thinking? And having those conversations and children talk about their mathematical thinking probably help them in other areas of language. What we provided was a language rich intervention. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't saying, tell all the teachers, say these words to the children. The teachers wanted to talk to children to find out what they were thinking. So like in conceptual subitizing, even just preventing, presenting that dice pattern of, of five, mm -hmm. right? How did you know? Right. I just saw five. Well, I saw f four and then one in the middle. Right. So I knew it was five. I saw three on the bottom, two on the top. Interesting conversations, even about such uh, ostensibly simple situations or contexts. Right. So the, the idea of learning trajectories is to make teachers experts. Uh, we know that most simple professional development doesn't work in the sense of uh, having a long-term effect. Go ahead. Um, we know it's an aspirational goal, and we know not, uh, we would love it if what we did in preschool would keep going forever. In other words, the effect that we had on children would form such a solid foundation that uh, they'd be able to build on that, and they would continue to do better than their, their peers. We have found, though, that for kids, you really got to follow through. Right. If there's the control group, there's the group triad uh, people is just our model for scale up and we can answer questions about that later. But, uh, but here, um, uh, the kids did not follow the, the same trajectory because they went back in a regular kindergarten and first grade. But when we worked and followed through with the kindergarten and first grade teachers, we didn't give them a new curriculum or all kinds of professional development like the preschool teachers got. But we did at least teach them a little bit about learning trajectories. And that kind of follow through led to much less of the so-called fade out that you experience. But there's another long-term impact too. Right, what we know is that uh, we went back and looked at the teachers. We looked back after we had finished working with them and we went back even farther than that. And this graph is probably my least favorite graph and we always say that and we also say we have to fix this graph, but we never <laughs> fix the graph. But the idea is, is that um, the, 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 the lines really don't, don't matter where they are. What matters is, is that in each case, they go up. So whether they, if they were doing a whole group, they were doing it better. If they were doing small group, they were doing it better. Um, I think uh, uh, if they're doing um, uh, the general curriculum as a whole, it continued to do better. And so, so we really do feel we have a lasting impact on teachers. Well, wait, wait, wait. Tell them, tell them about the first two things are within the study. Within right? the study, and then we went back. And then we went later. back two years later. That third, that third data collection. No lunches, no professional development, no more of anything. And we were worried it'll decrease right. because the research they is would, pretty clear. People fade out in their people. Use people of go a back practice. to teaching the way they're used to. So. But they didn't. Yes. Why? Um, because it was internalized. The idea that uh, you can never take away 
<laughs> what you know about children's development. You'll never, ask, you'll never again ask a child to count without asking how many. It's going to be intrinsically interesting to you for forever. And that's what I told the teachers when we were working with them is, look, I understand that in a climate in schools where everybody says, okay, now try this, okay, now try this, that after a year as you start thinking, okay, nothing's gonna work. And I said, they can tell you to change whatever you do, but you will never change the way you think about young children and their ideas of math. And that's they, what we changed. They didn't love it in fall. Right, right. But they, uh, I would say that, you know, in January, when you come back from break, from winter break, you're gonna really, you're gonna, you're gonna start liking things. And sure enough, when they came back, that's when they really noticed their children's learning. And when we talked to teachers about why, you know, what, were, what was good, they all said they didn't think their children could do as much as they did. They didn't think children were as capable as they were. So we opened up their eyes into the abilities of children and that, that again, you can't take that away. If, you've, if you know little kids who are coming from high poverty backgrounds can, can conceptually subitize numbers, you know, up until up till 10, when you were thinking they couldn't count till five, you've changed the way you're going to teach. Okay, so um, switching gears, switching gears, that's our old research, more or less. And now we're going to talk about our new research, where we really want to circle back and say, all right, we, we, we're not looking at the big scale up anymore. Let's go back and look at these individual learning trajectories. Because when you try to, when you look at, look at the whole thing, it's all learning trajectories. But let's look at the specifics. It's, the also, individual it's also specific to the activities. Exactly. Maybe building blocks is just better because we have really fun activities. It's not the learning trajectories that cause the uh, benefits that we saw. So what we did is we knew there was little research that tested the specific contributions of learning trajectories. So in a multi-experiment project, we've done about eight studies now, we're evaluating the use of learning trajectories using a much more stringent design. We take one critical attribute of a learning trajectory for one mathematical topic and one age of child, and then we compare it to a counterfactual that's very closely designed on that, but leaves out that critical factor or attribute. So in one set of these experiments, what we do, for instance, is we know that some people, our colleagues are listed there, say that providing accurate definitions, tell kids what the procedure is, give them practice. You don't need to go through every level in that. Just teach them how to carry the one in the, in the addition algorithm. or the, So you could skip those levels and be much more efficient by teaching them what you want them to do instead of following levels. So we'll tell you about at least two of these studies we've done. First one, shape composition. Okay, composing shapes. So what we did is the goal is for kids to be able to see that you can compose shapes kind of like our very first example where the kids were putting together the triangles to make the square. Right, remember? and we know that composition is important because, because it does lead to these later mathematical ideas both in, in spatial constructs and in numerical constructs. Yeah, even arithmetic, right. So real quickly, I think I'll actually turn down the volume here so I can talk over it for a second. So very quickly, this child is at the very beginning level. She can move shapes around and put one ear here and then one ear there. Uh, but there's very little of what we even see as matching the shapes, right? Um, this next child, very quick, this goes really quickly, but she's trying to put that square in the arm where you and I can see that only a blue rhombus or two green triangles is actually going to fit because she's matching sides, but not angles at this point. So watch what she does. She tries to put it in there and it knocks the other shapes out of the way. So she tries to fix those shapes and hold them down and push it in. That doesn't work either. So she finally gets up and lucky for her when she rejects that one, right next to her end is a blue rhombus. So she finishes the puzzle, but it's all by trial and error compared to this girl. Look at the uh, difference. And, and this is our goal level for, for early childhood. She, she thinks about each shape. She uses symmetry very explicitly. She, she doesn't just grab a shape and see if it fits. 
she has got a mental image of the shapes that she can see what's going to fit. She spends more time thinking about it. Look at this. Watch when she picks up a shape. Where does she look next after she picks up a shape? Watch her eyes. Back to the puzzle. Amazingly, she does not look at the shape. She looks at the puzzle and turns the shape into the perfect position by the time it hits the puzzle. So this is the, the kind of development. And we're really talking about, again, actions on objects. She's internalizing these, these mental images and she's acting on them mentally. So we, her hand's doing it kind of automatically, as opposed to the girl before who has to see the results of those physical actions. Perfect, perfect. So the first girl might get this and, the, and this puzzle second. The first puzzle has it really mostly only touches on the vertices so she can learn the matching that she needs to do. But then we'll, we'll give her a puzzle that shows the composition, but she still can do it just by matching right. the shapes. The second girl would get a more ambiguous puzzle like this to work on. And the third girl puzzles that really you have to look at the angles. You have broad areas and the like. And what happened? There's the, the kids at the bottom who were taught, remember, like I said before, but I didn't make it very explicit, the teach to target. They right. got the puzzles we wanted them to be able to solve right. for the same amount of time as the kids who got the easier, then the slightly harder, then the slightly harder. Huge difference in what they learned. Well, and, and the reality is, 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 is that was what ha would happen to play out in a classroom. Teachers wouldn't, wouldn't think about the kids' developmental progression at all. They would just, the children would pick the puzzles that had the best picture not the necessarily the best level. And so they would be operating on puzzles that were often uh, either way beneath them or way above them, just based on, oh, I wanted to make the rocket. They could see that it was a rocket and it would work. So this was not, it's not like a, a, um, a forced thing. This is what happens in lots of classrooms. And what we saw also is what we see in lots of classrooms where kids who are good at it, who are working at puzzles at, at, at their level or slightly above, are able to engage and, and meaningfully, and children who are not get frustrated or bored and, and don't engage. Okay, that was, so that was one study. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> we probably should hurry up through this one. Yeah, And people, we can anyway. send you these studies uh, anytime if you like. Uh, we also looked at an arithmetic learning trajectory. This comes much less from our research than the shape composition, which is actually one you invented. With. Yeah. Um, uh, but but it, it's a synthesis of just hundreds of studies. We looked at... 320 kindergartners, we did the teach to target. They got exactly the same amount of instruction, but at the target level. Right. And how did it compare? Well, it, it's not a simple graph where we did better. It really, you had to look at the individual things. So what you see here, I hope you can see it. Um, at the bottom is, or left, is arithmetic. Uh, they entered, entered with low arithmetic and low counting scores relative to this group of 320 kids. Here is arithmetic still low, but counting is high, right? And up here is arithmetic high and counting high. So what you see is most of the bold numbers mean that there was a significant difference, but not if they came in with counting low, but arithmetic high. Right. Those kids could do the arithmetic even without some of the counting skills. They were able to process it. But the largest effect sizes in the lower uh, right of each cell were definitely for kids that come in low. Those are the kids that are hurt by instruction that's ta not tailored for kids, but is just end of the year. This is the goal we want. Well, not even end of the year. It just has to be what page we supposedly are right. on that day, okay. whether or not it's developmentally appropriate for them. It's more the typical way kids are taught in schools, at least in the U.S. And uh, it's, it, is it frustrating for those kids? It's very frustrating. So they, they disengage and they don't, they don't do as well. And we're sorry we rushed through that a little bit. It's a pretty complex uh, diagram, but we'd be love it if anybody was interested in the papers. And, and yeah, and finally we have this next study that we're, we just started called Ultimate. And the idea is, is that uh, can we reach more teachers in remote areas by using our, our tools 
online uh, in professional development communities and through com things like Zoom. So we're working in a district that's pretty close to us that's completely shut down. So we're everything's on pause. But as soon as we can get back in schools, uh, we'll be back in schools and teaching. We didn't mention this website's, you know, URL. Oh, it's learning, learningtrajectories.org. It's a good way to explore the learning trajectories. It's not, it's not uh, very easy to use. It's a huge resource. It's sort of all, the, all, our, all our work out there. You can click on and see videos and and, and of kids at different levels, and then get the instructional things, right. PDFs of them, and and the like. Right, and and see children, yeah, see the videos of children's development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll be using this particular resource with teachers, as well as some additional games and uh, other things within a new, new upcoming study to see to see whether if we take away what teachers love, which is the book. You know, can we still help them um, help them uh, make a richer math environment for children and understand kids' thinking? So we've tried to provide practice-based evidence of success with clear guidelines for teachers. For instance, a lot of teachers are told formative assessment or differentiation is important, but formative assessment becomes just the assessment. Right. But we're trying to do all the parts. Keep the goal in mind. We know if teachers keep the mathematical goal in mind, they're more effective. Right understand the levels of thinking so you can understand the class as a whole but also groups and there are you know some teachers are, are petrified by that I'll have 16 different levels in right. my class nope you most classes you get three you get about three levels yeah. yeah and you can handle that with grouping but you'll have one individual who's way off the top of the chart and everything so maybe you have four but teachers who work with that kid find that they it's just wonderful to see what right. a kid can do and and we know and we're now now our next steps are to see if the scalable scalable uh in zoom culture in, in the area that we live now in the united states we have uh, a very tight urban areas but most of the most of the state is very rural and remote in the mountains etc so we want to see if we can make a difference in those communities that are really struggling with resources and uh access so that's it um, we have, hope uh, we didn't go too far over minutes. Yeah, and so. uh, we have the questions for the breakout room, but but of or course, or questions for us. But you that's know, not you, that's not next. You or next, Jake next, I believe is uh, is our is the discussant. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh yeah, that's right. Erno's next. Yeah. You does. I'm trying. So okay, thank you, thank you very much for the wonderful talk, and uh, I was so so happy when I noticed. Uh, that uh, you you accepted the, the invitation by by Mina and Jake to to participate in this this colloquium, and this this is because your your previous work, the published work, has has such a strong impact on on the way how we think about the early development of mathematics and how how this can be supported in uh, in kindergartens and and also during the early early years at, uh, in in primary primary school. So um, there were quite many, many interesting things in your uh, the, uh, uh, talk, which we could discuss more. But uh, I would start with very kind of general idea, which uh, you didn't mention here. But when I was listening, the way how systematically you were uh, talking about the uh, steps in these trajectories and how how uh, teachers can support uh, uh, in the very right ways in on certain levels of the trajectories. I, I noticed that something similar in the thinking uh, than in the zone of proximal development ID. Have you systematically applied that ID in your study? Boy, that's such a great question. And something we were talking about last night informally. Um, we, we almost added it to the slide. Yeah, yeah, because we were we were talking with our with our middle daughter about Vygotsky because um, that's the unfortunate part of being our children is that you're gonna have conversations about Vygotsky. But she's studying she's studying uh, uh, neuroscience and linguistics, and so it's mm -hmm. like. Wow, let's talk about let's talk about uh, thought and language. But we were just talking about that yesterday and how important that is and how most people don't understand it. The, you know, people know the zone of proximal development and they think that's a great idea. Where's the zone? What's outside the zone? What's in the zone? What's what's not? If you don't understand the developmental progressions, 
you know, you, you, you're really guessing, I'll just try something out. But if you understand the levels of thinking, it gives you a way into understanding the zone and because we have three parts, not just the developmental progression, what to do to help them get to the next level. So we love it. It's, uh, you know, it, ZPD and Vygotsky still influence my thinking all the time. And we're just trying to give tools for that. Yes. Yes. And then you have completely tied that uh, in many cases, a test uh, uh, using the term uh, zone of proximal development is not successful because people do not have that detailed understanding of the trajectories, which is uh, quite of necessary requirements for adequate support on, on certain certain level. And that's why this, uh, this way of, of thinking is very, very important. Of course, we, we know that it's, it's very demanding for, for teachers because they, uh, uh, at least on, on the early le levels, they are not only, only teaching mathematics. But you, you had a very mm, interesting comments about uh, uh, also the fear uh, among, uh, among some teachers that if you pay attention to mathematics, then it's away from other other skills. Is it a common way of thinking? Because we have uh, experienced the same, same kind of attitude in Finland. So that when, when we um, have proposed that uh, in kindergarten, they should pay a little bit more uh, attention to the mathematical thinking, the support of mathematical thinking, not teaching formal mathematics. Some people are afraid that now, now we are uh, kind of mistreating our children. They do not learn art or language or whatever because we focus on mathematics. Is this something you, you also realize in USA? Boy, boy, do we. That's, that's the whole idea of us doing that language study. We, we didn't come in thinking, oh, we're going to harm children's uh, ability to grow in, in, in language mm -hmm. and literacy. We knew when we were talking with districts that it was very difficult to get them to even sign on because they had, they had ideas that they had to spend hours and hours um, with literacy. And, and then, and then we, we just did that test just to sort of prove we didn't hurt hurt children right mm -hmm. but but also two then, tests right yeah. letter naming yes. and, and, uh, and oral sounds language. and oral language but all then uh what 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 happens is we get pushed back because they say um they think of it as play versus academics that's a big thing and math mm -hmm. is considered academics and not at all play and we're always saying how children learn through play and math can be playful mm -hmm. but we want to also be intentional and then we have the the um Another big thing with the, they, they call the soft skills, right? So socio-emotional development mm -hmm. and, and Executive you know, function learning how to get along, learning how to and play, learning how to learn. and, and a real rejection of any sort of STEM um, seems to be big that we're always kind of combating. And I think, oh, because we work in our communities and we work with our teachers, not, I mean, our communities, but people around the the, the world really who, who, who are asking us, I don't see that. And then when I have a conversation with somebody new, it really comes through loud and clear again. And then there is, there's one more bias and that is that you should only take advantage of the mathematics as it emerges from the children's activity in that moment mm -hmm. and, and go where they are. But the reality is, is we need to understand still where children are trying to get to, to slightly modify things, to have those conversations and to help them advance. Yeah. That not, you know, we, we, <laughs> we, have, we have four kids and uh, one, of, one of our kids played in the sand table in preschool every day, the entire time. That's all he wanted to do. And if they were waiting for mathematics to emerge from him playing with the sandbox, <laughs> it wasn't going to happen. It, but, um, you know, so, so yes, did we want him to play in the sand and get along with his peers? Absolutely. But we also want to acknowledge that in order to consider the whole child, and all children that we have to also talk to them about mathematics because that is part of who they are. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is of course telling a lot uh, about the uh, beliefs uh, people uh, often have about mathematics. That mathematics is some, only something very formal, written uh, algorithms and and uh, doing this kind of formal formal things. They do not see. Right mathematics in everyday life and uh, all kind of activities, how it can be embedded here. And um, uh, that this is uh, related to my, uh, my next comments or questions, which is really, uh, you, you mentioned that those uh, 
there's uh, an opportunity to uh, to pay spontaneously attention to mathematical aspects in 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 environment and uh, uh, it can lead huge amount of uh, practice of, of thinking of mathematics and and uh, uh, of course uh, that that has been one of the main point in in our in our research because we have that, yeah. that uh, is a kind of theoretical argument argumentation why these spontaneous focusing tendencies uh, do have the, a strong impact on mathematical learning so that it it uh, leads to, to a certain kind of uh, self-initiated practice yeah. and have you studied that more the self-initiated practice in in uh, situations where you are not guiding children to do anything not specifically i mean in the in the you know obviously we take it's your a really good idea. search right and and build on that but we're assuming that it's all good <laughs> and that we've done it we haven't used that as one of our individual studies so that would be like what we're doing now with the studies of arithmetic and shape composition <laughs> specifically looking at development of uh, um, of supertizing and recognition of number um, by by really focusing in on that those spontaneous experiments um, but we what we we do is the number one thing we say with professional development that what do we do if you can do one thing do this we of course have said that over and over again but we haven't done any sort of um comparison yeah we've relied on your guys fashion. research uh, uh truthfully for that yeah, but we have. i will say informally we hear from teachers all the time and parents right the hexagon, for instance, and the right, like, you know, right. um, one, one parent rushed back into the preschool one day and said, my kid, we just walked outside and my kid said, look at, look at the, the walk we're walking on. It's all hexagons. You know why it's hexagons? Because they fit together perfectly. Mm -hmm. And the mother said, what are you teaching them in here? Uh, that and, and similar things about number and, and things like that. We get a lot of stories, very informal. But no, but no rigorous, no rigorous uh, scientific. On the spontaneous focus. <laughs> on the focus. spontaneous focus or, or structuring the environment. It's just something that we say to do. Like I said, Luke, Luke could be playing in the sandbox the entire time, but but if a teacher says, "Oh, look at the look at the look at the four trucks over there," or "Can you can you make can you make a garage? Um, can you put three trucks in this garage?" She's taking advantage of the environment and still honoring him. So, yeah, we we that's what we're that's what we hope. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, I'm very interested in in your concept uh, uh, this uh, the conceptual subitizing because. Uh, I, I feel that this is an uh, extremely powerful way uh, to think about the bridge between this kind of uh, uh, more informal mathematical thinking and then the formal uh, 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 mathematical procedures taught uh, in, in the school. But unfortunately, this is not, not widely used elsewhere than in your, your project, but I am pretty sure that this is this is some uh, a term and, and a way to think which we also want to apply in some of our uh, uh, and also in, in, in the models how we how we uh, mm -hmm. to, to uh, support young young children's mathematical development. But, but mm -hmm. this is uh, excellent. So how how widely it is used in, in USA? Is it only I, in your experiments, or is this term now more widely used? Last August seventeenth in the dictionary that comes in to me, like word of the day, you know, learn this word. Subitizing was the word on August 17th. So I, I was amazed by that and think that there's a little bit more of a recognition that you've got to do that. It's, in, it's, it's been um, uh, put into standards, right? Head Start standards and other kind of influential standards. But I will say, Erno, that it's only for babies and small kids and small numbers, that the conceptual subitizing is gonna take another wave of education and, and things to, to get in because I, I think people think of it as just recognizing well, small like, numbers and then drop it. People like Grayson Wheatley and Karen Fusion incorporated it in their work and, and then they, and they in their work with curricula. So, so in the US it's all about the curriculum and for them that means the books. And so it's, it's in there, but I, I would think again that uh, even in talking to Karen, she would say that her books are only for the teachers who are already sort of predisposed to having uh, um, an understanding and teaching kids at a higher level. That for the average teacher, it's, it's, it's not such a good thing. Weirdly, if you just like Google activities for, that teachers make, 
for subitizing, they're all pretty, pretty bad. You know, they really aren't subitizing. They're not conceptual subitizing. They're just, they're just, I don't, I don't know. They're, I don't know what they're thinking, but, but uh, I think the, the word is out. The idea is kind of mm -hmm. out. And the idea that this would be purposely built in for kids as a foundation for arithmetic is much less so. I think they still don't mostly understand that it, it actually develops before and then in parallel with counting. Right. Once they get to the point where they're counting, people drop it. Mm -hmm. And they don't think about keep going on. So, so it's still working. But that you we might have, have seen real quick. We went through the slides very quickly. We get it up to first and second graders, where we show them three tens and four ones, and five right. tens and six yes. ones, and for two seconds, and they have to do that. And it's such a good anecdote to them thinking, oh, I have to write the numbers in a row, carry the one, and that you know. Because because it's it's true quantity that they're operating on, not numerals. Yes, yes. Because uh, so theoretically, the part whole thinking is of course very important, okay. but, but it, it is not uh, so systematically used in in mathematics education. But this uh, uh, conceptual supervising uh, ID gives very interesting ways to to deal with that. Our Swedish colleague, colleagues in uh, University of Gothenburg. Uh, Ferenc Martin and later on uh, his colleagues have developed a, a very nice computer game, which is yeah. flying. We, we, we met with them a few years ago. Mm -hmm. about it. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, 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 it's cool. And, and, and then they, yeah, they use your fingers kind of yes, thing. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah. That's such a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then uh, about the teacher, uh, teacher training, teacher's professional development. I, uh, I, I think that this, uh, uh, the way to look also how sustainable is the effect is ex extremely important and, uh, and because uh, this is very well known that uh, that teachers professional development uh, uh, often has no effect or if it has effect it's a very short term effect but then how to how to have a kind of sustainable effect and this is in my opinion related to to uh, findings from general expertise research. Uh, research. So, Anders Ericsson has shown this, uh, uh, the term, uh, the concept of uh, arrested expertise development, so that then uh, people are not uh, spontaneously developing their the skills further. But I, I think that something you, you mentioned that uh, if they, they uh, understand the, the process, then, then they cannot stop using that. And then the practically they continues to develop it further and, uh, and this is of course something I, I think that we we, we should uh, uh, be able to to do in in teachers professional development that not just teach them what what exactly to do but to understand why to do something and how they can develop it further yeah that's so well stated yeah and it, it's um it's something that we really struggle with uh, uh, giving value to because in the communities that evaluate our research that are looking at mm -hmm. saying is there something that we can do in early childhood that will affect children for the rest of their lives uh, through through you know affect graduation rates affect college affect income you know they're looking at it from a scale of economics they're saying what money can we put in early childhood that will have a return on investment but what they don't think about is that what the work that we do with early childhood teachers who typically don't go into the field because they have a love of mathematics. And in the U.S., they get maybe one course before they go begin to teach about children's math thinking. And that's good. Lots of times they get like four or five classes on it. They come in, they don't have that understanding. And so if we can affect that, then we've affected more children. And the, the idea for us, of course, is to, like we're saying, is, is to do that not only in preschool, where we're doing the majority of our research and scale up, but continue that with kindergarten teachers and first grade teachers so that they can articulate, articulate the, the, the mathematics of children through those years and, and build on it. Uh, we, haven't had, we haven't had the opportunity and or the funding to do that kind of work, but, but I'm, I'm proud of what we did with the teachers in preschool, and I think it needs to be built on. Uh, and then, uh, uh, one, one question I, I have had in my mind when I have been reading your, your uh, publications and now when I was listening to you, uh, 
this way of thinking seems to be very powerful in in supporting the early mathematical development. But have you been thinking uh, uh, how the the same principles could be applied when we uh, move uh, forward in mathematical development uh, from natural to to rational numbers and, and even to algebra? Uh, yeah, and. And Jer, Jer Confrey has done a little bit of, of learning trajectories and rational numbers, yes. but Erno, you, you probably know that field way better than me. It, it is fortunate for early childhood that we've had so many people, early childhood people, math ed people, cognitive scientists, uh, you know, when these, when these ideas are first forming, everybody wants to study that. So we yes. had such a richer research base than there exists for primary and middle and, and high school. But, but I know of very little of the research. It's, it's still coming, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we, but the chair convened a learning trajectories conference as well. There's a group of people, you know, internationally that are working on these things in different, era, in different areas. So I feel like, you know, the research is coming. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes we have, uh, yes, we have uh, seen some of the, the papers of, uh, and Jeffrey about uh, the learning trajectories to to fractions, for example. Yeah, yeah. partitioning it looks promising, that. and I, I look forward that this this will have an in, uh, impact on on the uh, uh, more more kind of advanced uh, mathematics teaching as as well. Thanks, and, that was great. And now, sorry to interrupt you. I would love to listen to you the whole evening and the night. <laughs> it's it's uh, been such a, such a pleasure to listen to you. Now it would be time to jump into the breakout rooms. Yes, hi, I, I wanted to stop by and say thank you for coming and wasn't it fantastic to hear them? Oh, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Ah, I'm, I'm just enjoying <laughs> so much and I kind of enjoyed uh, listen to, listening to you, Judy, as well. So. Yes, yeah. hey. Hi. We're really grateful for all the work that you did and for making it be open and available to everyone. It's, yes. it's what we need. We need it yeah. to kind of keep our, our personal our personal stamina going so that yeah. we can yeah. take some of the weight from people who are doing the incredibly hard day to day work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're very yeah. grateful to you. Thank you. Yeah, well it's it's we do this together. <laughs> this wouldn't <laughs> exist without you being there as well. So <laughs> It's also a nice to kind of have this community feeling and in different ELOC meetings uh, or mm -hmm. sessions, there's been very different crowds of people around because Erno is so uh, kind of, he has had so many multiple different focuses in, in his research. So I will give now the floor to Jake. Shall I share the screen? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I, w I don't, I won't take up too much of your time. I, I, uh, um, but yeah, I just I wanted to thank Doug and Julie for this excellent talk. I, I, I think that the thing that I come away with with from your research and, and something that, you know, from a research perspective is uh, just this idea of really trying to bridge very thoughtfully and carefully um, this basic research on, on development and cognitive processes and things like that and how kids really truly can learn best and really applying it um, in practical ways and then also evaluating it very rigorously. So I want to thank you for providing that example and providing us with uh, inspiration um, for us going forward and thinking about how how we can impact education in, in the most uh, effective and, and, and meaningful way. So thank you for that. And, and of course, thank you to Mina and Erno for um, uh, organizing this. And um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming and sticking around. And we just wanted to remind you that uh, in two weeks, then we're going to have Pierre Dillenberg, um, who's going to be giving a, a bit of a different talk, a bit of a, a kind of more, uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure how exactly to describe it based on the abstract, but go read the abstract. I think it'll pique your interest <laughs> and um, provide y you with some thoughts about kind of what the changing nature of education. I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, talk and, and surely an interesting discussion then um, afterwards. So hope you can join us. And then of course, you all being maybe uh, more math oriented, we'll have John Starr then um, a couple weeks after that talking about flexibility. So um, yeah, 
But uh, thank you all again for joining.